Welcome everyone, I'm Oscar Sabakti and this is Africa Matters. More than 200,000 Burundian refugees have returned home in the last six years, but what's life like upon their return? And we'll bring you a story about a South African dance style with resistance roots that's going global. The Burundi refugee crisis began in April 2015 when civilian protests broke out after the former president, Pierre Nkurunziza, refused to step down after serving two terms in office. The military responded with brutal force and targeted killings, forcing more than 400,000 people out of a population of about 12 million to flee to neighbouring countries. Now, figures from the UN's refugee agency, UNHCR, show most of them fled to Tanzania, which hosts more than 126,000 Burundian refugees. This includes those who had sought asylum before 2015 and about 42,000 others who have lived there for decades and no longer receive humanitarian aid. Rwanda hosts the second largest number of Burundian refugees, with more than 48,000 living there. The Democratic Republic of the Congo hosts some 44,000 Burundians who have fled the country, while Uganda has about 41,000 refugees. According to UNHCR figures from February this year, Kenya is home to more than 26,000 Burundian refugees. And southern African countries such as Mozambique, South Africa and Zambia all host less than 10,000 refugees, while Malawi has about 13,000. But as UN agencies face cash shortfalls and soaring food prices, partly as a result of the war in Ukraine, humanitarian assistance is drying up. The governments of Tanzania and Malawi have been rounding up refugees and asylum seekers living in urban and rural areas, saying they should remain in refugee camps that are often overcrowded. Burundian President Avaris Ndayishimiye, who came into power in June 2020, has been urging those living in exile to return. Recently this month, the UNHCR repatriated 38 Burundians from Malawi's only refugee camp, Zaleka. It's the largest and the first group of about 200 people who have volunteered to return to their home countries since the camp opened in 1994. Lamek Masina reports on their journey home. Neoguizela Glorias came to the Zaleka camp in 2010 after she fled conflict in her country, Burundi. But the single mother of three children says her stay in Malawi has been unbearable. Life has been difficult here in the camp. I suffer from diabetes, and when I'm sick, there is no one to take care of me. It's just me and my kids. When I heard there is peace at home, I felt that it's better if I go back right now. There's no one else here who helps me. Glorias is one of the nearly 200 refugees, including those from Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, who the UNHCR says have volunteered to return to their countries. The voluntary repatriation was the first of many since the Zaleka camp was opened in 1994. Government authorities say the repatriation will help to reduce numbers in the Zaleka refugee camp which is now home to more than 50,000 refugees. That's more than four times the number of people it was designed to accommodate. However, only two Burundians have returned home since 2010. The numbers are not that high where we could say that uh, this will make a huge difference to our situation. This is why we are encouraging that uh, the repatriation is voluntary. We know that situations have changed in most countries of origin, as we have seen for the Burundians, and this is why as government we are encouraging that those that are willing and able to return back to their home country, they should emulate the example that their friends have done. The voluntary repatriation comes as the Malawi government continues to forcibly relocate refugees to Zaleke refugee camp, where many complain of living under dehumanizing conditions. The World Food Program in Malawi says it is facing a funding shortfall to provide adequate food for the refugees, while the UNHCR says it has only received 15% of the requested budget for this year. Malawi's government has an encampment policy which prohibits the refugees from staying or working outside the refugee camp. However, UNHCR says it is working with the Malawi government 
to have the policy and similar legislation revoked, allowing better integration of refugees. It's work in progress. We are advocating uh, the government so that they, they, they review they review the 1989 Refugee Act and leave the reservation on, on freedom of, of movement and other reservation like naturalization. Malawi government authorities say they are looking into those possibilities, but in the meantime, going back to their home countries remains the only available option for refugees in Malawi to live a better life. Lamek Masina, Africa Matters, Doam, Malawi. Well, let's get more on this now from Olawali Ismail. He's a senior lecturer at King's College London's African Leadership Centre. He joins us now from London. Really good to have you with us, Olawali. We don't often hear about refugees in Africa returning to their home countries in large numbers. So what makes the situation in Burundi different that allows for this to happen? Uh, it's a complex uh, situation and we should not Paint brush the stories around refugees returning. Yes, over 200,000 Burundi refugees have returned over the past two to three years uh, from neighboring countries, especially Tanzania, where the majority of refugees have been since the political upheaval in 2015 to 2017. But um, refugees return across Africa sometimes without media coverage and the rest. But this particular one is quite uh, important because of the numbers, but also because of the region. Uh, that region in Africa has historically hosted the highest number of refugees um, uh, on a per capita ratio basis. And in the last two to three years, uh, there has been active uh, support, encouragement provided by UNHCR for refugees to return to Burundi. But the story of return is not a one story, and we should not fall into the danger of a single story. There are many stories, there are many realities. For some, um, going back to Burundi, you know, makes sense. Is there, you know, the conditions are right for them to be back uh, to their native communities. For others, it is the circumstances in their host country that has driven them back to go to Burundi. So as you would know, the whole Great Lakes region has been quite unstable for a while. The instability has notched up uh, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months because of events in Eastern DRC, but also in the border region between Uganda and DRC where ADF has been quite active. So we have to factor in the rising turbulence, the rising insecurity, in neighboring countries as also a factor in the return of refugees back to Burundi. Can I ask you now about the conditions of some of these refugee camps in Africa? We know there's growing demand right now for a dwindling amount of humanitarian aid, which is having an impact on the living conditions in many of these camps, not only in Africa, but across the globe. So is that putting pressure on refugees to leave some of these camps and return to their home countries, even though the situation in their home countries might not be ideal? Yes and no. It's always going to be a cost-benefit analysis for every refugee family, you know, for every refugee, you know, group to decide whether they are better off in their refugee camps or going back to their respective countries. Um, in, in Burundi, it is true that since the last election in 2020, the current ruling government by President Evariste has done some level of reform, has opened back dialogue and engagement with the international community to lift you know, sanctions in exchange for some reform. But of course, there are fears that the reforms have been half-hearted, they do not go far enough, and that some of the underlying structural issues, structural causes of insecurity and conflict in Burundi are still there. But of course, the situation is better today than it was two or three years ago, no doubt about that. But whether that situation is, be is better for every group of refugees, I don't know. 
but of course, as well, the experience of refugees, those in Malawi, those in Tanzania, those in DRC, those in Rwanda, those in Uganda, and some of them are also in Tanzania, in Kenya. The experiences and the situation in those refugee camps are different. The conditions are different. So in certain situations, in especially in DRC, refugees um, have had to leave because of insecurity, but also because of you know the lack of uh, adequate facilities in those refugee camps in the you know eastern DRC. So the experiences of those refugees are quite different. And for each group of refugee, they have to weigh up whether the conditions back in Burundi is good enough for them to go back. But of course, as Africans, our home is home. A refugee camp is not meant to be a home. It's not meant to be a permanent place of abode. And I think uh, at some point, refugee groups, refugee families, we always have to look forward to going back. But let me emphasize something here, that if issue of refugees, there's a long history of refugees movement, refugee being hosted uh, in that part of Africa, dating back to the 1960s. And you see that uh, even some of the those who have been in power in places like Rwanda, in Uganda, in DRC, in Burundi, they've been refugee at some point. You know, some of them were born in refugee camps, or some of them have had to move when they were children, you know, with their family across the border because of safety issues. So there is a long history, a long story of uh, people being displaced in that region, people becoming refugees and going back to their home countries at some point over the course of a lifetime. So it is not a new phenomenon in that region. But what is what is happening now, you know, there is a global context, as you have highlighted. Uh, humanitarian resources are drilling. The war in Russia and Ukraine is diverting global humanitarian resources to attend to that. Uh, development agencies and, you know, donor communities are yeah. uh, prioritizing African situation, humanitarian situation less than they were 10 years ago. So all of these have cumulative impact on the conditions in camp, the experiences of refugees. Okay, Olawali Ismail, we will have to leave it there, but really appreciate your analysis on this very important issue. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. To Mozambique now, where an uneasy calm in the north of the country has inspired many civilians to return to their homes. Tens of thousands have fled fighting there since 2017. The insurgency has largely been quelled, but as Rahul Radhakrishnan reports, there's still a long way to go. It hasn't been this busy and peaceful in northern Mozambique for years. Residents are returning to their homes in Cabo Delgado. The province has seen years of heavy fighting between insurgents and government forces. For many in the town of Palma, the scars of why they left are hard to erase. We could hear bullets being fired every day at that time, so we ran away. The UN estimates nearly one million people fled to neighboring provinces since violence erupted in 2017. We walked about 150 kilometers. Along the way, we slept hungry or got soaked in the rain when we were in the bushes. We lost our children and our possessions. The gas-rich province was taken over by armed groups who are said to have links to Daesh. But the fighters say they are fighting the state. The Mozambican Defense Ministry admitted that their troops couldn't hold back the insurgency on its own. In 2021, Rwanda and the regional force Samim formed a multinational effort to clear them from key areas. Now, even though the militants are largely defeated in the region, soldiers remain on alert. We agree with the president of Rwanda. Next, we will create conditions for the return of the people. And we've done that, but we still have a long way to go. It took the armies of several nations years of deadly fighting, culminating in thousands of deaths, to reach this fragile peace. The hope here is that Maputo's forces can allay any security concerns. Rahul Radhakrishnan, Africa Matters. 
Civilians in Ethiopia are struggling to recover from two years of violence in the northern Tigray region. Despite eight months of a relatively successful ceasefire, the extended conflict, along with a hostile climate and the suspension of humanitarian aid to the region, continues to take its toll, as Yunus Emre reports. Ten. That's how old Tesege Shishe is, and how much she weighs in kilos. Acute malnutrition has made her body so frail, she can't even digest liquids. Now she doesn't take any food as she is severely damaged by malnutrition. Initially, we were trying to give her soup mixed with milk, but unfortunately, she doesn't take food now. This is all because we didn't have any food in the beginning. So Tesege's parents brought her to Arden Hospital, but she's not getting any better. She is also getting treated for hospital-acquired infections. The medicines are very expensive because they are third generations. It can cost the family from 11 to 15 dollars approximately, but they are a displaced family and they don't have the capacity to purchase the medicines, neither could we provide it. So we are seeing, we are observing her while she is going to what is painful. And the outlook for millions of other children in Ethiopia is similarly grim. I understand that the number of children who are sick due to food shortages is now higher, but the issue is that we could not treat these children properly. Once we treat them and show improvement, we will send them back home. However, they don't have anything to eat and they will get sick and come back again. It is becoming a vicious cycle. It is very frustrating for us and painful for the families. Tigray relies heavily on agriculture. Almost three quarters of people in the region are farmers. But two years of civil war has not only displaced millions, it's destroyed plantations the whole country relies on. And to exacerbate the situation further, the country has entered its sixth failed rainy season. Nine million people in northern Ethiopia are in need of food aid, according to the UN. Aid that had previously resumed after the ceasefire was suspended by the United States and United Nations in March and extended to the whole country in June after claims that it was being diverted to local markets and the Ethiopian military. WFP is making significant strides towards restarting food distributions in Ethiopia as it continues to roll out essential reforms to the way humanitarian food assistance is delivered in the country. We are currently on track to resume food distributions in July, starting in the Tigray region. A recent tweet by Tigray's Interim Regional Administration President, Getachu Reda, confirms that efforts to resume aid operations in Tigray are ongoing. But until that happens, 20 million Ethiopians in need will have to wait. Yunus Emre, Africa Matters. While the conflict between Sudan's army and rival paramilitary rages on, the country's rich artistic heritage is at stake. Cultural works are being destroyed, museums face uncertainty, and historical artifacts are under threat. There are now urgent calls to protect Sudan's cultural treasures before they're gone. Taha Duman has more. The conflict engulfing Sudan since mid-April has taken a devastating toll on human lives and also endangered the country's rich cultural heritage. As rival military factions continue their power struggle, experts are racing against time to protect Sudan's historical treasures. We know for a fact that libraries have already been destroyed. There's a library in Omdurman um, at Omdurman Alia University that's been burnt and um, valuable books already just irrecoverably um, destroyed. We're particularly concerned, of course, about the films in the, um, the film archive, the ones that we haven't scanned, um, because there's many, many that we haven't scanned. The Rapid Support Forces, one of the military factions involved in the conflict, has denied claims of museum destruction. They've offered a glimpse inside the Sudan National Museum to reassure the public of its safety. Artists like Salah Abdelhay, who fled the war to Egypt, have seen their life's work disappear. Now, we are trying our best 
to do some effort. First of all, in the way of uh, talking to the community and to prepare to the community and to dissimulate the importance of the archaeological uh, remains and sites and museum to the public so that they could help themselves uh, in this uh, effort to protect the sites and the monuments in the, uh, in the Sudan. Sudan is home to two UNESCO World Heritage Sites, Moreau Island and Jebel Barkal, showcasing the Kingdom of Kush dating back to ancient Egyptian times. While these sites are relatively calm at present, there are concerns over looting and theft. The other aspect that uh, represents uh, a threat to the safety of the two uh, World Heritage Sites is that the area itself located for both World Heritage Sites uh, has turned into a shelter uh, and displacement area for a large numbers of uh, Sudanese. Uh, the fact that made it very difficult to preserve the integrity of the existing monuments from threat and human enforcement. Sudan's vibrant music scene has provided solace and unity amidst the chaos, but even the power of music can't shield the country's cultural heritage from the devastation of war. As Sudan's people endure the hardships brought by the ongoing conflict, preservation of their cultural heritage remains an urgent concern. Talha Duman, Africa Matters. We head to the south of the continent now, where dance is more than just entertainment for South Africa's Pantsula dancers. Their unique style emerged in the 1950s among black South Africans living in settlements as a social and political expression against the apartheid government. Now, Pantsula dancers hope to take that message to the world. Bushra Goktash explains. Their bodies speak a unique language called Pensula. This rabble yell wants once a social expression of resistance for black youths. And dance company via Katlehong has now taken the dance to the global stage, which shows in France, the Netherlands and Portugal. This Pensula is a, it's a South African township culture. It's, it's a culture and on its own. In the culture, we have uh, our way of living. We've got our fashion, we've got our music, and um, we also have dance. And most of the dance, for, the, the, the dance styles, that uh, um, it's our daily life basis. So the movements that you see in Pansula, it's our daily life uh, uh, basis. We speak about our, our life. And at the same time, uh, in Pansula, it's more like a survival. The pioneering dance group was established in 1992 in the township of Katlehung when riots against the apartheid government were a regular feature of life. And for the youth today, it's helping them survive in a different way. This pansula changed my life in a very huge way. Why? Because there were so many riots happening around. So for around or exposed around those situations. It's easy to get hooked in drugs or crime. Pensula has now evolved into a whole culture in itself. And some say despite its resistance roots, it could offer a fresh perspective. We're in an African Renaissance. And so the whole world is looking to Africa to solve its problems. And so Vayakatahong is Honestly, it's a platform to offer solutions to a lot of the ills that have happened because of the history that we've experienced as, as a globe, to be honest. So I think they are perfectly positioned to usher us into the newness that Africa needs. In the vibrant herd of Africa's beat, the revival of Pensula is catching fire again to show the world a new step. Bushra Göktaş, Africa Matters. This week, we explore Labe, which is in West Central Guinea. It's one of the major cultural and religious centers in West Africa, especially among the Fulani people. Let's take a closer look.
And that's our show this week. Kindly share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories on this episode or ideas on what you'd like us to cover in the future on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search for Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment and share. See you next week. <laughs>